God did raise Jesus from the dead, and Jesus did ascend into heaven. Now, in fantastic fashion, the world has been changed. It was the greatest act of love. Today, as we look at the events that unfolded as recounted by Matthew, we will ask some questions. We will ask, why did Jesus have to die? And a little spoiler here, there is no definitive reason, only ideas and theories as to why. But the bigger topic we will discuss today will be about what happens next. Because what happens next is what affects you and I today, where we live, how we live, and what we do. Let us begin, though, with prayer. Gracious and almighty God, we give you thanks that today we have a celebration, the hope of life in Christ, a life new, renewed, remade through his wonderful resurrection. As we open your word today, God, may it speak to us loudly and clearly. May we see you in ways we haven't before. May we be changed. And having been changed, may we go and serve you in new ways having new life in you, I pray in the name of Jesus and through the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Jesus was laid to rest on Friday. The family and disciples of Jesus were not able to fully prepare the body at the time, so they needed to go back. They laid him in the tomb, unfinished, and they needed to go back. As we read today, the Sabbath prevented their return straight away, and so they had to come back later. And then they did return to prepare the body, but as they returned, they were met with surprise. Some of the women came to Jesus, and as they returned, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to the tomb. They were met with a great earthquake. And then an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and rolled back the stone and sat on it. Not all the Gospels agree as to the events that happened, but they all agree that the stone was rolled away, that there were angels there to greet the people. Once he appeared, his appearance was like lightning. It was so bright, his clothes were as white as snow. When the guards saw him, they became mortally afraid, and they shook, and they passed out. They were like dead men. And then the angel says what an angel always says when they come to you, do not be afraid. Obviously, we need to hear that in that moment. They said, do not be afraid. I know that you're looking for Jesus, the Jesus who was crucified, but he is not here. In that very moment, the whole world changed. As Jesus was raised from the dead, things were different. Now, God has interacted with humanity before. This is nothing new. God has interacted with people throughout all of history. He walked and spoke with Adam and Eve in the garden, interacting, indicating to us that this was an intentional act of intimacy between humanity and the Creator something that was intended to be, something that was ruined and destroyed. God spoke to Abraham. He made a covenant with Abraham about how he would create a people of his own. Later in scriptures, God wrote on the wall a foreboding message to encourage change in a king. Then there was Moses' interaction with God, first at the burning bush, and then later at Mount Sinai. But these interactions that he's had previously were vastly different than the interaction that he had with Jesus Christ and Jesus' interaction with the world. First, God sent his only Son to live among us. As a man, Jesus walked among us. He taught, he spoke, he ate, he lived with us, being our example. He performed miracles, brought healing and change to the world. God interacted through Jesus in a manifestation of real uh, time uh, interaction with somebody that was corporal, that we could touch and feel. 
But Jesus wasn't just any person. Jesus was a sinless man. Jesus, fully human and fully God, was able to live as a sinless person, which is important because his being blameless was important to God's plan. Lastly, as a sinless man, Jesus was willing to lay down his life for us all. This was the sacrifice that we needed to have a fully reconciled relationship with God. In an unprecedented way, God interacted with the world to bring about all that was necessary and needed for us to have a fully healed and a right relationship with God. This was the ultimate act of love for all times. God sent his only son into the world, a world that would eventually reject and kill him. God sent his son who lived a sinless and blameless life and was finally willing to lay down his life for all of humanity. But then God performed the incredible miracle of raising his son from the dead. After being in the grave for three days, God did the miraculous. He raised Jesus from the dead. Oddly though, that's not the first time this has happened. It's not the first time somebody was raised from the dead. You remember the story of Jesus and Lazarus. Lazarus had been in the grave four days and Jesus came to be with Martha and with Mary who were grieving their brother's passing and he raised, Jesus, uh, raised Lazarus from the dead. It was a bit of foreshadowing of what was to come. It showed that if Jesus had the power to raise somebody from the dead, then God the Father would be even more capable. It meant that when the disciples saw that, that death could not hold Jesus, they would not be entirely shocked, for they had seen this before. Now, I ask that you allow me to be a little bit more deeply theological for a moment. This is a subject on which much time has been spent and much ink spilt trying to answer the why Jesus needed to die for our sins in order for our sins to be forgiven. And while we join in this conversation, I want to start with a little caveat. I want to let you know that we can only suppose the why. The reality is that despite all the time that's been spent and all the ink that has been spilt on this subject, they are still our best guesses as to why Jesus had to die, what his blood had to do with our forgiveness. The early church fathers wrestled with this way back in the 4th century, trying to make sense of why Jesus had to die. We jump forward to the 11th century, and Aslan, um, uh, Anselm and Abelard, Peter Abelard, two contemporaries, wrestled and fought with each other about why Jesus had to die and had different opinions. And today we still struggle with why. Now what we know is God provided the means by which people of God could atone for their sins. Something that had been put in place long before Jesus. God wanted us to be in right relationship with him and provided a way through the law handed down to Moses for the sins of the people to be atoned for. The Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, is the day when the blood of the Lamb was used to clean or expiate the sins of the people. These were strictly the sins between the people and God, not between person to person. The sins between people were atoned in a different way. But the sins between us and God had to be atoned with blood. And on the Day of Atonement, the blood sacrifice was used in multiple places as a means for cleaning and expiating sins. Now from this, we get many different ideas of what the blood of Jesus signifies. And we can argue on the many different theories. The theory of sanctification, the theory of atonement, the theory of substitution, the theory of sanctification, and so forth. I'm sorry, satisfaction. Here's what we know. If we look at John 3.16, we read, For God so loved the world that he sent his only Son that we might have everlasting life. Have everlasting life. The key word to this passage, by the way, is love. It was love that motivated God. It was God's love for humanity. It was God's love for you and for I. 
And while we can argue on the theological implications and understandings of the whys and wherefores, the reality is that it was that the reality is that on this side of glory, we simply cannot know any of the certainties of the whys and wherefores. But we are left accepting the mysteries of God's immense and gracious love that allowed humanity to sacrifice the Son. It was Jesus' love for God and for humanity that enabled him to allow himself to be sacrificed. Jesus gave his life that we might have life. John 10, 10, Jesus tells us, I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. Jesus came that we might have abundant life. Jesus wants us to have abundant life. So what is abundant life? How is it marked? How would we know it? First, I want to tell you that abundant life is marked with clear relationships with the Father, the Creator of all. Abundant life is evident in people living in right relationship with each other. The clearest evidence of sin is a broken relationship. Sin destroys relationships. That is the, uh, the, 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 the curse of sin. Adam and Eve, when they sinned, they had a broken relationship with God. From then on, we have suffered with broken relationships, person to person, people to God. And over and over again, We've had to have a way of coming back to God, a way of making our relationships right again. A clear marker of abundant life is a life and a relationship that has been healed and made whole. Christ died that we might have life in abundance. Our relationship with God was made right in what he did in his sacrifice. He gave us a way to have a good and whole relationship with God, something that is missing when we sin, something that is destroyed when we sin. Our relationship with God is made right, and our relationship with each other is made right. This life in abundance is for our eternal life, yes, but it is also for the here and the now. We have a relationship to be in relationship with God. We have an opportunity to be in relationship with God here and now. Abundant life here on earth and forevermore. We need to know that it was God's love through Jesus Christ that gives us life in abundance, both now and forevermore. But there's something else we need to be aware of. On the cross, Christ offered us forgiveness. Through his sacrifice, we were all forgiven. But that's only half of the equation. Forgiveness is only the start. If God's love is is evidence in relationship made right, then we are called beyond the point of just accepting that forgiveness that has been offered to us. Just accepting that forgiveness, by the way, is what Bonhoeffer calls cheap grace. We're called beyond just accepting. We're called to do something more. We're called to live in that restored relationship with God. We need the forgiveness that Christ offers. We need that pathway to God that was broken through our own sinfulness. We have broken a relationship with the Creator, but through Jesus we have been restored. So if forgiveness is the start, then reconciliation is the next step. Let us understand that forgiveness is a solo act. One person has to forgive in order for that relationship to have the opportunity to be made right. The next step is reconciliation. And reconciliation requires two people. God calls us into a reconciled relationship, providing us the pathway with Jesus Christ. Now it's up to us to step into that relationship to find reconciliation, both with God and with one another. And this is the blessing of the resurrection. We have this opportunity. We've been healed. We've been cleansed. And now we are called all because we are so dearly loved. Today, here and now, know that you are loved. And once you know that, now you can go and you can share that love with others. Today, here and now, know that you are called. You're called to live into that call, to be reconciled unto God, <coughs> to give God your love. 
Give back to God that love that was given to you. A love that was willing to accept death on the cross and forgave us of our failings and called us into loving relationship with God. That is the meaning and the celebration of Easter. Praise be to God. Thanks be to God. As we say, Alleluia, 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 Amen. Let us now pray. Lord God, we give you thanks that through your love we have been made right with you. Through the love your Son offered us, we have a pathway to you. We pray, God, that today we are made different and new, realizing and holding on to that, that hope, realizing that forgiveness was given, but now we move into reconciliation, which requires our walking with you in new ways. Help us to see how we can live reconciled. Give us the strength to move into that new life that you give to understand how we can live a reconciled life to join in relationship with you new today. And help us to share that with the world, God. Even though we are separate and alone, help us to find a way to reach out to share that good and wonderful news. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Before we finish,